Hi, I'm Samaya Ahmad. I'm an assistant professor of ophthalmology here at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and I specialize in cornea and external disease, and I have a particular interest in dry eye and ocular surface disease. Yeah, dry eye certainly can happen in any age, um, especially for people who are, you know, on the computer reading a lot. I am finding it happening more in younger patients, but it's definitely more common and more symptomatic in people as they get older. And I think a lot of very good epidemiological studies have shown that. So particularly in people, you know, above age uh, 50 and 60 uh, tend to get more severe types of dry eye. So usually it's uh, both eyes. So most people will get a burning, tearing, um, foreign body sensation, like there's something in there. You can also get itching in the eyes. Um, oftentimes, I'm, I think people will get um, asymmetric disease where one eye is bothering them more than another. And so um, those are uh, common symptoms. I will say that there are a subset of people who don't have those symptoms of burning, tearing, and foreign body sensation, and they actually just get blurry vision. Um, or sometimes, you know, blurry vision that doesn't happen all the time, just like toward the end of the day or other um, times when they're performing certain activities such as reading or on the computer. So um, the first thing to do if you think you have dry eye or let's say you're reading a book or on the computer for many, many hours a day, like the, a lot of our people would work from home after COVID is uh, see if, try, try using artificial tears. Artificial tears are over-the-counter lubricants. These are drops basically that you can get at any pharmacy. Um, if, if you're having really symptomatic disease, I would recommend starting with preservative free tears. These come in individual vials. They don't come in a bottle. And the vials are, are um, nice because you can throw them away within 24 hours um, and they don't have any preservatives which can be toxic to the eye. So that's the first thing I would do is to, is to try using drops at least three, four times a day. And if you find relief after using the drops and the, and the vision improves or your symptoms improve, then most likely it's dry eye, although it could definitely be other things. So I would start with the simple stuff first. Um, and um, I would also try to modify your environment. So you can like get a humidifier uh, and have that running in the room that you're spending a lot of time in. The winter tends to be worse for a lot of people. So um, doing those things can help. The other thing that can actually help a lot is to stop uh, using um, antihistamines if you're able to. So Benadryl, Claritin, Allegra, all of those medications um, have an effect that cause people to have worsening of their symptoms. So stopping those particular medications can be helpful as well. And so if all of those things, you're modifying your environment, you're stopping the antihistamines, you're trying artificial tears, are not really keeping your symptoms at bay or you're still very symptomatic, then I think you should consider seeing um, me or um, another eye doctor for advice. So dry eye can have a lot of reasons. Um, I will talk about uh, the most common reason. The most common reason actually doesn't have to do with the cornea itself. It actually has to do with the eyelids and the structures around the eye. The eyelids are really important because they actually um, have oil glands and the oil glands secrete oil to prevent the tears from evaporating. And um, if, the, if the oil glands are not secreting oil the way they should be, um, then the tear film basically evaporates. So you close your eyes and blink constantly throughout the day, but when you have your eyes open, the tear film is going away too quickly. And um, that is the most common type of dry eye that is out there. Um, and that's the most common type that's exacerbated by things such as reading, um, you know, and using the computer and phone use. And so that's the biggest reason is the oil glands are not functioning properly. But people can get dry eye for a lot of other reasons that are related to systemic diseases like autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's syndrome. Um, they can also get cancers that can cause infiltration of the lacrimal gland that can cause problems, graft versus host disease. Those are a little bit more rare entities, but for the average person who is otherwise healthy and having these symptoms, oftentimes it actually has to do with the oil glands. And this doesn't happen for any particular reason. It just it's sort of like people get acne or people have you know, certain kind of freckles, like it just sort of is part of the anatomy of their, of their body, um, but something that can be quite symptomatic and bothersome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people have started using terminology like computer vision syndrome, um, which sort of describes like blurry vision after staring at the screen for a long time. You know, there's not um, a lot of evidence that the screens themselves damage the eyes or the retina. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that blue light filters do much. 
Um, but there is evidence and there is lots of evidence that um, using the screen basically makes you blink less. Like the reflex that's there in the brain to blink is not there as often as it should be when you're focused on a particular task and particularly when you're using the computer. And so when that happens, um, if you already have a tear film that's evaporating too quickly and then you're staring at the computer with your eyes wide open for hours and hours, that can cause problems. And it has often to do with, the, with dry eye. And so, um, you know, taking a break can help and, um, you know, modifying how long and how much you're using the computer or just being mindful about how, how much you're on the computer, but also about blinking while you're on the computer can, can sometimes help. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes the symptoms of, of having contact lens um, dr related dry eye would be when you take off your contacts at night that the eyes are like kind of like stuck on and they feel like there's like a foreign body sensation uh, when you take off the contact. And oftentimes people who have dry eye actually feel like putting the contacts on makes them feel better than when they're off. And when they're off, it's like really uncomfortable. And that actually is an indicator that you have pretty significant dry eye, maybe should be um, examined or have other kinds of ocular surface problems. Um, co contact lens use re results in um, problems with the meibomian glands or the oil glands of the eyelid with the dry eye for a large segment of the population who's been on it for long periods of time. So um, it's very common. It doesn't mean you shouldn't wear contacts. It, it just means that you, know, you should talk to your eye doctor about how to use them safely and how to use them in a way that's not gonna cause like permanent damage over time. I think that people who have symptoms should use them as long as they're having symptoms. Again, I prefer people to use preservative free tears, not regular tears, um, but uh, using them during times where things are getting worse. And that would be like, let's say you're in a certain office building or a certain environment that's causing it to get worse, or it's the winter time and this tends to get worse in New York with all of our um, you know, radiators and things going on. Um, you might need to use it throughout that time. I would say, you, people should use it at least two or three times a day who are pretty symptomatic. And if you're finding that it's not really you know, relieving you of your symptoms after that time, then you should come in. Um, but in terms of how long, I would say at least two to three months. That's actually a really good question. I'm actually working on a paper um, right now that you're from the Nocturnal Surface Society to look at these exact questions. So smoking obviously has a uh, Air, smoke in the air has chemicals, like irritants that can cause people to have or tearing and burning and issue, chemical sort of in, um, problems with their surface of their eye. So probably that would be helpful. And I think there's pretty good evidence that that would make a difference. In terms of diet, um, the evidence, we're looking at it now, like the co cohesive evidence, and it looks like um, probably hydrational status has something to do with it. Um, certain, you know, vitamin supplements, like maybe, uh, at this point, I would just say people should just in general eat healthy and drink water. If you remember, if we're all so busy and have so many things to do that we often forget to just do simple things like drink water, um, and that can make a difference. Um, um, but in terms of particular things that can help with dry eye, I would say, um, you know, do the things that a, a, your primary doctor would want you to do. Eat a multivitamin, drink water, eat healthy, you know, but nothing special. Um, that's a, that's an unfortunate thing about the condition is for most people, it is sort of chronic. And the hope is that you can get to a place where you only need treatment at certain like exacerbations when things get worse or sort of a baseline level of like, okay, it's getting a little bit worse now. I'm going to try X, Y, Z and see if that makes a difference. For most people, especially who have eyelid related disease, it is a chronic condition, um, but it has ups and downs. And I've certainly seen people who had a lot worsening and then they get better over time. Now, depending on the cause of dry eye, let's say you have other kinds of conjunctivitis disease like allergic disease or graft versus host disease or other entities that are happening in your body, um, you can certainly have much an acute worsening and then we can treat you for a short period of time and then the symptoms mostly go away. And that certainly can happen too. Um, but those entities again are a little bit more rare, but for the average person who has oil gland, eyelid related disease, that's just, um, it's a chronic condition. Yeah, I would say it's not as common in younger people. Um, you know, I think maybe more teenagers who are spending a lot of time on the computer or on the phone, like they are now with Zoom and COVID and all of that, it can happen more often. Um, and the very young kids who are, you know, um, not on the computers as much, there are certainly conditions that can cause dryness, um, but they're often related 
closely to the eyelids or other systemic autoimmune conditions that cause significant eyelid disease and, and you know, uh, scarring and other problems with the cornea. So those are a little bit more rare, um, but certainly can happen in all ages, although it's definitely less likely to happen in younger people who have healthier tissues and healthier eyelids and um, corneas and all of that. I think practicing good habits will probably just lead to sort of the mindfulness track where you want to make sure that, you know, kids are not completely being absorbed in anything that can cause uh, problems in terms of their eye health. Um, I think uh, taking a break, I think you had written something about the 20-20-20 rule. I think that's a reasonable thing where every 20 minutes uh, you take a break uh, for 20 seconds and look far away. Um, that it mostly helps to reduce the strain on the eyes for looking up close. Um, in terms of dryness, I think particularly uh, what's helpful is to lubricate and then also to not uh, be focused on a near task, you know, so you're not like looking at a phone or a computer. So even though you're off the computer, you're reading a book, it's sort of the same thing. So to go outside, be in green, uh, in a place that has greenery and you're looking, you have the sun sort of coming down on you, I think actually can be very helpful um, for children who are very nearsighted or myopic, that 20, 20, 20 rule can be particularly helpful to try to help stimulate their bodies to not be accommodating and looking up close all the time. So um, for children in particular, I think the nearsightedness is, is, a, is a big problem that we're facing, um, but also in terms of the cornea and like dry eye, I think that would be a reasonable thing. Um, for most adults who are on the screens for hours and hours a day, I think taking a break every 20 minutes is probably challenging. So I think every 40 minutes would be reasonable. And then taking at least a five minute break is what I tell my patients. Um, so they can, um, uh, you know, not be doing the thing that's making them just stare at the screen, you know, and not blink. You know, it, I'll be honest, I don't think there's any permanent damage that can happen. You know, the only thing that can happen is you get symptomatic disease and you get blurry vision, symptomatic dry eye and you get blurry vision. And so that can be annoying and that can cause um, a lot of like symptomatic issues where you, you know, you have what I described, um, but it's not going to actually physically damage your eyes. So um, that is good, you know, because our lives are like this now. So um, being mindful of, of just like how much more time you spend and how, what are you actually doing during the hours of the day can be really helpful. There's a lot of, um, debate and discussion about these blue light filters. There was a decent study that was done that showed that they actually don't really make a difference. Our corneas and our lenses that are part of the actual eye help to filter out the blue light. Um, so um, you don't need a special filter to do that. And uh, the studies that showed that there was damage to eyes from too much screen time or blue light were done on mice at levels of blue light that are like not what we use in an everyday setting. So I will just say that the blue light stuff, like don't spend a ton of money on it. I do have patients that feel like it makes a big difference. So if that makes a difference for you, go ahead and use it. Um, but I don't know if it's backed by evidence. Um, and so um, other ways to just protect yourself from screen time, again, is just to be aware of how long you're spending. I think probably eight, eight hours a day is a good amount of time if you have to spend more, obviously you can, um, but if you're getting really symptomatic from, from the dry eye, then you need to be more aggressive about lubricating on a regular schedule rather than just when you remember it. And so I think that can actually be pretty helpful for people too. Yeah, um, I think the only thing I would say is that if you're an older person who has been trying a lot of over-the-counter stuff and drawing warm compresses and artificial tears and all these things and you're not getting better, please come in because there's just a lot of things that can be happening that people are not aware. And I've certainly seen uh, patients, even on the younger side, who are not even older, who come in and they have a lot of things that are going on that we need to treat more aggressively with pills or, or special kind of blood drops or other things. So um, don't hesitate to come in. It can be a real problem. Like it can be other pathologies that are happening in your eye, but also representative things going on in your body. Um, so it, it doesn't always have to be a benign disease, but for most people, thankfully it is.